Well, on Monday we actually had some form of, of, of news, and surprisingly I'm doing this on Tuesday, and at the time of recording this, we still haven't actually heard anything about Brexit negotiations, whether there's been any breakthroughs or anything like that. Now, of course, hopefully, hopefully, there will have been. However, on Monday, France basically said, and was very clear and very echoed by uh, other, uh, some of the European um, uh, ministers as well, that if there isn't a deal on fishing, then as far as they are concerned, it might as well just be no deal. Now, I'm going to do another video on my thoughts about this completely separately, so uh, look out for that uh, on this channel as well. It might come out before, this might come out after. We'll see. Um, but I think we're going to go through this article today because this article highlights not only why is this such a sticking point in the negotiations, but also why essentially not reaching an agreement on these on these fishing rights and essentially people and countries sharing their fishing grounds is going to cause such a huge problem partly because believe it or not lots of people especially the brexiteers don't seem to understand that there's no really such thing as a british fish you know if a fish is born in british waters it doesn't automatically get you know slapped with a Union Jack as soon as it comes out and immediately belong to British fishermen. That's not the case. Fish just do not respect international borders and they just swim around all over the place. So, you know, it doesn't make sense. So you need, this is one of the things where we've talked about on this channel before, where we need international solutions to international problems. And one country just going it alone is not enough to solve this problem. This is why the EU was created in the first place. And we're about to find out. And very, very soon we will see lots of other uh, institutions in the UK saying, OK, we need to be part of this. We need to be part of this. We need to be part of that. And as I keep on saying, we will just slide back into the EU because we'll just get to a point of people just saying, well, why aren't we in the EU then if we're in all these things? So. Anyway, let's get straight into the article. This comes from Politico, and I like the name of it. So, In Cod We Trust. How fish became such a Brexit problem. Forget the... Uh, Paris, forget the loathes. With a Brexit cliff edge... Uh, with a Brexit cliff edge looming, the question is, who will share out the fish? As Britain and the European Union manoeuvre towards a post-Brexit trade deal this week, an industry worth a minuscule share of their GDP, an economic spat, a mere tiddler, could sink the entire talks. This slippery question, causing such agitation on both sides, is who will have the rights to catch what and, once, uh, and where once the UK carries, out, uh, carries off many of Northern Europe's richest fishing grounds starting the 1st of January. The problem could be solved if both sides face their differences honestly and prepare for public opinion or compromise. As things stand, a poisonous mixture of political over overbidding and technical complexity threatens to capsize the entire post-Brexit negotiations. In the UK, Fisheries account for only 0.12% of our GDP, but the industry has attained a somewhat patriotic symbolism and political strength more inflated than that of the car industry or the City of London. Misleading and emotive arguments about how the EU, quote, stole our fish in the 1980s have created a sea monster of overblown post-Brexit expectations that Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government cannot now easily kill or even tame. On the EU side, the real economic stakes seem equally small. Only five EU member states, France, Ireland, Denmark, the Belgians and the Netherlands, are vitally concerned about the loss of fishing grounds in the Channel, the North Sea and the Atlantic. For those nations, however, fish is more tangible than many other theoretical uh, seeming arguments surrounding Brexit. The dispute threatens the survival of age-old industries, vital to the national economy, as in Denmark, 
or to the prosperity of political sensitive towns or regions as in France, Ireland, Belgium and the Netherlands. Consider, for example, the northern French fishing fleets of uh, Paris de Calais and Normandy and Brittany. They take up 60% of their catch in what will become British waters from the new year. They cast their nets on the northern side of the English Channel and in the North Sea, and also as far, far away as the Atlantic coast of Scotland. These rights were not given uh, to the French boats or taken away from British ones when the EU's fisheries policy was created in 1983, as UK public opinion had been taught to believe, the European, fishery, uh, European fisheries had been a free-for-all for centuries. Before the exclusive economic zones were created, the first up to 12 miles from coastlines and then out to 200 miles by the mid-70s. When Britain joined what was then to be... Uh, what was then the European Economic Community in 1973, it agreed to merge its potential 200-mile fishing rights with all of its neighbours, something many UK fishermen have always resented. By dint of geography and fish behaviour, most of the richest northern European fishing grounds will be, post-Brexit, within Icelandic, Norwegian waters and the British waters. And European governments, led by French President Emmanuel Macron, insist that Britain's departure from the EU must be a no reduction to catches or access to the new British zone. Otherwise, they say, all other trade deals with the UK are off. This is an unrealistic and absolutist point of view. As the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, pointed out in private to EU diplomats last week, the French and other governments should start preparing the fishing industry and wider opinion for some degree of... Uh, of Piskeen pain. If there is a no deal between Britain and the EU on the post-Brexit trade deal and other issues, the UK would be within its international legal rights to stop all EU fishing boats from entering its economic zone from the 1st of January. Such a ban, as Barnier pointed out, would be even more calamitous for the French and other fleets than a cut, uh, than a cut in permitted catches or quotas. A fishing war would be an equally calamitous for the UK. Some, uh, something that the loudest mouths in the pro-Brexit politics and in the British fishing industry prefer to actually ignore. Some of the most vibrant parts of the UK industry have, have, uh, have nothing to gain and everything to lose from Brexit. Four-fifths of their catch of shellfish, lobsters, crabs and, and, lang and languinists are sold overnight to the continent, mostly to Spain and France. This industry will be destroyed if there is no post-Brexit trade deal to lighten the regulation and keep tariffs off food exports. The present UK approach to fisheries and negotiations is an unpleasant blend of shoot yourself in the foot and beggar thy neighbour and dog in the, in the manger. What would Britain do with all the horse mackerel and sprats caught in the North Sea by the Danes if... Uh, uh, by the Danes to grind into pig feed, or all the French catches of sal saltine and coal fish, which is uh, which is uh, little eaten in British uh, in Britain. Anyone for coal fish and chips. A more reasonable UK approach to the fisheries question would be to seek a deal that increased British catches, but that didn't attempt a wholesale grab of much of how much fish is caught by the EU boats. In return, Britain should seek relatively easy continued access for British fish and seafood to the EU. Instead, the British government originally offered the Europeans nothing, except annual discussions on swaps of EU catches in British waters for British catches in EU waters. Then, uh, then it improved its offer to a three-year period of diminishing quotas following an annual discussion with no guarantees. No industry could be expected to survive on such short-term horizons. The British insistence on annual discussions with no long-term fixed pattern of catches or catch shares is now the single biggest obstacle to a deal. As in, also as in uh, ideal, uh, also, also an ideal dear to militant British fishermen leaders and a source of great dishonesty on the part of the UK government. The last month, Britain's Environmental and Agricultural Fishers Minister, George Eustace, outlined an, uh, outlined an agreement with the non-EU Norway on future London-Oslo cooperation on fishing. 
He claimed in an article in the Daily Telegraph that this deal was the was the uh, was a model for the kind of annual no guarantees negotiations that Britain is hoping to seek from the EU. In fact, it was quite the opposite. According to the leaked text, the deal is modelled on the EU on the EU Norway agreements going back to 1979 to 1981, giving permanent shares of six main fish stocks. This is close to what the EU is now asking of the UK, a lasting share uh, out of uh, share out stocks, uh, and then an annual discussion on what tonnage of fish is scientifically safe to catch. If I was a suspicious fisherman, I would wonder if the British government was intending to pull the same trick in the talks with the EU. London will claim uh, that it has won the battle for quote annual negotiations, and it will allow uh, it will allow them to uh, allow them to take point in yearly talks on allowable fish tonnage, which have always existed. In the end, as has been true throughout the UK EU negotiations, there is a deal to be had if both sides want it enough. They face a choice between uh, the devil of a no deal and the political dangers of the deep blue sea. And there you have it. Um, we've always said on this channel, the problem with the, the, especially the British fishing industry is A, it won't face up to facts. All the British fish, the vast majority of British fish are sold to the EU. So in the event of a no deal, uh, this doesn't harm you know, as much as the, the, it will harm the, the French fishing fleets and the the, uh, the Dutch and the Netherlands, but it will absolutely destroy the British fishing industry, an industry who overwhelmingly wanted to support Brexit and has made this whole thing into some sort of patriotic baton to carry for people. It just doesn't make a damn bit of sense. Now, of course, what was said there about um, the exact same thing of what we're trying to sign between, you know, the U the Norway and the, e the UK is exactly the kind of thing that Nigel Farage and many of the pro-Brexit people have very vociferously argued against for years and even the past four years. And this just doesn't make a damn bit of sense. And I'm just beyond bewilderment about what is being discussed in this in this talks. But he's right at the end there. There is a deal to be had. The problem we have is that the EU wants to do a deal. Let's be under no illusions of this. The EU does want to do a deal. The problem, of course, is that our government, our very pro-Brexit government, does not want to do a deal because it wants privileged access without having to take any responsibility. This is the main sticking point we are in. And it's not just fishing. Take about what we've been talking about recently about the state aid rules and what we just signed up for with Japan. The EU, you know, is a lot. The EU is a lot lighter on what it is asking compared to the harsher deals on state aid, which we signed up for the Japan one. It is absolutely insane. Now, I, 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 I've got to be careful because I want to save that for another video. So, you know, I'll we'll save that for another video. But you can tell I'm getting very visibly heated up because this just doesn't make a damn bit of sense but then there you go that's brexit for you so please do hit that like and share button it does help out the channel lots and of course if you are new we do talk a lot about british politics and of course brexit as well because the two are going to be inseparable and trust me even though quote brexit has has just begun this is just the beginning of the beginning of our true brexit woes so there's still a lot left to come and if you would like to support the channel in another way there is a one-off donation link and my link to my patreon page down below in the box should you like to uh, contribute that way and thank you to all the people that have done so far your uh, your support is very very much appreciated so with that it's see you next time i, I I was going to try something with fish, but I couldn't think of anything off the top of my head. So anyway, we'll see you next time.